Hello and welcome to Psalmary Speaks, episode 20, Thacko. In the beginning, there was chain mail. Combat was resolved on D6s, death was swift and permanent. Then came Dungeons and Dragons. And when Dungeons and Dragons was created, it expected that you would be using chain mail to resolve mundane battles, battles between ordinary opponents, goblins and the works and other humans. Uh, for example, versus your player characters. But an alternate combat system was presented in the first, in the original three little brown books. An alternate combat system was presented which had the armor class, the d20 rolls that we are accustomed to in, well, basically every version of D&D since then. The release of the first supplement, first in-print supplement, Greyhawk, uh, upgraded and extended the alternate combat system and made it pretty much the standard combat system, although you still could use chain mail. Um, how much it was used, I don't know, back in the day. Um, and the expectation was that when a combatant attacked another combatant, you would um, look up the class and level uh, or type, whatever, of the attacker on the appropriate attack matrix and you would read down the column or, or across the column I believe they're well down and across it depends on the version of the game um, which you would uh, read the table matching the um, class and level of the attacker versus the armor class of the defender and this would give you a minimum target number that had to be reached on the d20 in order for a hit to be scored Roll a d20, add any uh, bonuses or penalties that might apply to that particular attack, and if you re equaled or exceeded the target number that you had found on the table, you'd made a hit. We used Descending AC because that was how the game was written. Um, I have been told that the Descending AC number system was taken from some naval game. I don't really know. Um, there are others who know much more about the detailed history of the game. But I want to address a couple of things. Um, in those early games, people playing um, uh, original D&D, people playing uh, advanced D&D, people playing the first uh, Holmes edition of the basic set or the Moldvig Cook Marsh uh, basic and expert rules, the expectation was that you would read the tables to get the answer to whether or not a hit was scored. That was how it was done. Um, I have had a number of people come to me, uh, talking to me, uh, about the old games, um, who use the term Thacko interchangeably with Descending AC, but they're not interchangeable. The first time I saw Thacko and, and noted it um, was in a module. Um, and I actually, it took them looking for me to find an explanation of, of how you did it. Um, in a Thacko system, you have, uh, hi Cole, you have, you take the number from the armor class zero column or row from the table relevant to your character or monster. The number for armor class zero for the class and level or the monster's hit dice, that is the two hit armor class zero or Thacko number for that combatant. If you want to know if that combatant scores a hit on an opponent, um, you subtract the opponent's AC from the Thacko number and you are left with um, the actual target number needed to be hit. Remembering that when you subtract a negative you add, it's your grade school arithmetic, so a negative 4 armor class adds to the target number. If the target number was a 16, a negative 4 armor class would make it a 20 required to hit. Um, Thacko was invented by somebody who found looking things up on a table inconvenient. I don't know. Um, and it became kind of an option. Not everybody used it. I know for sure not everybody used it. Um, but there were, I'm sure, many people who did use the Thacko method. Now, strictly speaking by the book, if you're playing Advanced D&D First Edition, Thacko by itself doesn't work quite right because the tables in the Dungeon Master's Guide have repeating 20s and there's a whole rule, whole par <laughs> dense paragraph of explanation on page 82 of this book 
that uh, explains how you interpret those repeating 20s. Um, I have read uh, Poster on Dragon's Foot stated that you could use that code, but there was exceptions to how you did it. It sounds like more stuff to remember to me, honestly. I'll admit, I never used the repeating 20s tables from Advanced D&D. Even when I ran Advanced D&D, I used um, tables of my own calculation that basically were more like the BX game that we had played before. We were accustomed to that, and I didn't see the point of repeating 20s. But by the book, if you're playing first edition AD&D, you really can't use Thaco directly as a method for figuring out whether you hit your target or not. Um, the math for this is simple. Uh, the mathematics for using Thacko are simple. There is an alternative way of looking at it um, that applies the bonuses and penalties to the target number. Uh, I will admit to you that the person posting it, uh, I saw it on a forum, thought it was easier. I found it even more difficult. Um, I brought this up for two reasons. One, because of the number of people who think we had Thacko from the beginning. We did not. Um, I started in 1982 with the 1981 BX rules. We didn't have Thacko in any of the books then or any of the modules I had available at that point. Um, AD&D did not have Thacko as a standard method and really, as I say, couldn't if you played it by the book. Um, Thacko is not something that really was there from the beginning. Um, so if you, if you had that opinion, it's not really how it worked. Now, um, the other reason I bring this up is because I, I got in an argument with it with a guy about this online the other day, uh, and and this goes back if you watched my video about accommodation about helping people with enjoying the game regardless of whatever their physical or neurological limitations might be in terms of being able to play the game effectively, um, and this goes back to that. Um, I I am slow looking things up on tables. I always have been. Um, when I mentioned this in a conversation years ago, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, well, yeah, a good friend of mine said, I, I thought you were smarter than that. Thank you. Um, but I, I am. I'm just slow doing it. Um, I, I'm slow getting that stuff done. Having the table on my GM screen, assuming I used one, which I don't use a GM screen. I did only very briefly when I ran Advanced D&D &D, um, many, many years ago. But I really never use a, uh, a screen, so you know, having the numbers on there, even when I used it, one, really didn't help me much. I'm still slow. And as the game master, I'm looking up the numbers much more often than the players are. Typically, uh, in my games, player players would have on their character sheet a place to put down their entire uh, row or column from the table with all of their armor class target numbers from, um, you know, 9 or 10, whatever the worst armor class is in, in the particular version, because that does vary between versions, all the way down to negative 10 or, or, or thereabouts. So they would just read down a column and they had one number and that's actually pretty quick. But I had to read the tables over and back again and, and I found myself to be slow at that. So you think that I would be thrilled with Thacko. I'm not. Um, I'm even worse using the Thacko method than I was using the table method. Uh, because I, I can't do math in my head. Um, and this is where the argument came from. The person I argued with um, expressed to me that he believed that I could learn. I'm 58 years old, folks. Um, I can do math in my head better than I could before. I can do addition in my head fairly well, but I have difficulty when we get up to two-digit numbers and deal with negatives keeping the numbers in my head. It has always been a problem for me. I've always been bad at it, so I never used Thacko. I never liked Thacko. Um, I had shortcuts and tricks for using the tables that would allow me to bypass the problem a lot of the time. Whether that meant looking up um, and marking off the, tar the target rows or columns in advance of a fight, or um, making a bunch of notes on scratch paper as I went along so that once I had a target number for a monster I didn't have to look it up again. Whatever. 
um, I, I, I'd already adapted to the tables. Um, doing the subtraction in my head, I was slow. It's not that I got wrong answers. I'm not stupid. I can do the math. I just can't do it quickly. And I found this was a constant drain on my attention. When I should be paying attention to what my players are saying, I should be paying attention to the strategies that I'm trying to employ with my NPCs or monsters. I should be reacting to the situations. I should be dealing with things quickly. There's always a pressure on the game master to quickly move through things, if at all possible. It makes the game better if you don't drag anything out that you don't have to. Um, but the extra drain of my attention that re required to do the very basic mathematics involved directly affected my game in a negative fashion. It, it just wasn't as good. Um, and as I say, I'm, I'm 58. I'm probably not going to learn anything too significantly new at this point. This, all this stuff happened when I was young and my brain was pretty plastic. Um, it's kind of gotten crusty up in there now and I can't really acquire a lot of fancy new skills um, or even simple ones, I'm, I'm afraid. It, then as I was creating Basic Fantasy, well, as I was, before I even began to create Basic Fantasy, when I first saw the third edition rules and the ascending AC system, mathematics that was almost entirely addition, um, very little in the way of subtraction, very little in the way of things. I can add much more quickly than I, see, I can subtract, I suppose, because it basically amounts to counting. Um, I can do that much quicker. Uh, and I I liked it. I mean, uh, I've said this before. I've said this on this channel before. If I had if I had thought of ascending AC in 1982, I'd have used it then. Um, I would have used ascending AC from the day I learned it existed, um, and I did, <laughs> and I did. The game that I ran before Basic Fantasy, the, the, the house rules game, what I call Project 74 that I ran, um, had Ascending AC because once I saw it, I'm like, why would I ever want anything else? The last Descending AC game that I ran was a second edition AD&D campaign that I ran around, I think it wrapped up around 2002, 2003. So it's been 20 years since I've deliberately used a descending AC system for more than a demo game. Um, one of the things that constantly surprises me about old school gamers is the almost religious devotion to various uh, various mechanics. I like the old school mechanics because of how they work. I like them because of the way that they make the game play. Um, using reaction rolls versus using um, the skills provided in, uh, in, a, in the D20 based games and the later games for influencing people. Reaction rolls just seem more natural to me. They work better. Reaction rolls are super flexible um, and can be a great utility for dealing with social interactions where the game master doesn't already know what the NPCs want or want to do. The dice are an easy way to figure out what they want to do. Um, I like uh, the way the initiative mechanic in Basic Fantasy works. It's why I chose it. Um, it is very basic. It is very old school. It's pretty much what we did back in the day. Um, and yeah, um, I like it. I like how it plays. Um, every aspect of the old school games that I retained in Basic Fantasy that I retained um, for, for use in my own games. Uh, I mean, honestly, I wrote Basic Fantasy first and foremost for myself. Um, for my own games, um, but uh, every mechanic that was in, it was in there was chosen because it felt right. Um, either because it felt like the old game or because I knew I liked how it played, how it worked in play. I don't see any mechanical advantage 
of descending AC over ascending AC. If you like that, if it's what you want to do, if you're running a game using descending AC, uh, running an old game like first edition AD&D or um, Iron Falcon, something like that that uses descending AC, and you enjoy that, great. Absolutely do what makes you happy. Um, and if I was a player in your game, I would suck it up and do what you wanted me to do. But then again, as I said, players don't have to do the math as much as the Game Master does. So it wouldn't be a problem for me. Um, I would have my combat column written out on my character sheet, and I would just have to know about that and probably nothing else. Maybe if I had a retainer or an animal, I would have to keep track of separate numbers for them. But it's still not complicated in that instance because I've reduced the size of the problem substantially. Um, so if you're a big fan of Descending AC, great. If you like Thacko, fine. Do that that way. If you look stuff up on tables because you're really old school, I had one person tell me that he would never use Thacko, and the best as I could tell was because he'd never had, and he was never going to. That's fine. Uh, if you're playing AD&D First Edition and you want to play by the book and you understand the repeating 20s rule and you're using it, fine. Whatever works for you as a game master is fine. But don't, I don't like it when people tell me that there's something objectively better about Descending AC or there's something objectively better about Thacko or objectively worse about Thacko um, or that Ascending AC is some kind of an abomination. I've been told that. I don't understand it. The numbers for Ascending AC are no less arbitrary than the numbers for Descending AC. I mean, they're... They're just, they're just numbers that were chosen out of a hat, um, as it were. The base ACs for um, characters who were not using magic and did not have a dexterity bonus in the original game, in the original, you know, three little brown books, ranged from two to nine. Two to nine. Um, because the best armor class that you could get with metal armor was three, and you could you could deduct another one down to two for using a shield. Um, sure, your dexterity bonus could lower that, and so could magic bonuses, but at that point, the numbers started becoming negative. It's not as if the scale really meant anything. It's kind of like Fahrenheit. It doesn't, re doesn't really, in the real world, it, it, it seem, may seem comfortable, but it it's not any kind of magic. So, anyway, um, so we've had a technical discussion of the game, a historical discussion of the game, and I've had a good rant. Um, although I really don't think I'm ranting too much. Do what works for you in your game, uh, if you know, with, with whatever game you're playing. Um, one of the things I do have to admit that I really like about Swords and Wizardry is it presents both ascending and descending AC with tables that are designed to work either way. Um, just for the record, if you're uh, running basic fantasy and using swords and wizardry uh, materials or vice versa, remember that our armor classes differ by one. Uh, you need to add one to the um, ascending AC number for uh, swords and wizardry adventures to make them work properly in basic fantasy, and you need to deduct one if you use basic fantasy adventures with swords and wizardry. They, they differ by one point, and it was just a matter of how we chose to do it. Um, <laughs> And it's arbitrary. It's as made up as that two to nine range was. Um, I, I made one decision and Matt made another. Work with whatever you prefer. Um, I guess that's it. Um, short one this time. Uh, I am fairly confident I will have another video out soon. Um, there's another subject I want to talk about and, and we'll see how that goes. Hopefully I can get that done soon. But in the meantime, um, Thanks for watching. Have a nice day.